Thank you very much. Um, so as Marcy said, I'm Aaron, and I'm a web standards and accessibility advocate at Microsoft. Um, some of you who've been around for a bit uh, probably know me from my work at A List Apart. I'm uh, currently editor-in-chief there. Uh, I also was a manager of the web standards project back in the day. Um, but today I want to talk about something that's kind of near and dear to my heart that I'm getting more and more excited about. Um, so chatbots and digital assistants are kind of becoming all the rage now. And most of these, if you aren't aware, work from specially coded data sets and models. But there's more than four and a half billion pages of content stored online, trapped in many cases within our websites. Articles, stories, blog posts, educational materials, books and marketing messages, all on the web, but for the most part, an untapped treasure trove of content that could be useful in a non-visual context. Now, there have been a few projects, Search Engine Spiders probably most notably, that are working to turn that often unstructured mess into something usable, right? But we can do more, a lot more, to enable our pages to be usable both by real people and the computers that power voice-based user experiences. And that's what I'm here to talk about. I want to release that content from the screen and empower it to go anywhere and everywhere. I want it to find its way into virtual assistants and other voice response technologies, and even into voiceless chatbots, without requiring us to code and recode over and over again into multiple redundant formats. I also have a dream of enabling our users to actively engage with our content by filling in forms or manipulating widgets just with their voice. And this sort of stuff is becoming possible. Specifically, I'm here to talk to you about how we can use HTML and ARIA to make our content structured, sensible, and most importantly, meaningful. And it all begins with the humble element. So consider this M element. Sure, it's visibly rendered as italics, but it also adds emphasis to the content within. HTML is just chock full of elements like this that convey meaning, nuance, and relationships. And being aware of these enables us to author more expressive documents. And ignoring them can actually undermine the usability of the content that we're marking up. When we create a web page, we need to be mindful of the conversation that we're creating with our customers in that process. And we need to choose the elements that we use with intent and care. One of the best indicators of how HTML will make it into our virtual assistants is another assistive technology, screen readers. Right? Not only do screen readers do as their name implies, but they also enable users to rapidly navigate a page in various ways. Um, and they provide means to translate visual design constructs such as proximity, proportion, and so on into audible cues. At least they do so when we author our pages thoughtfully. So without further ado, let's jump into some solid examples of how we can create more meaningful documents and empower them to be more usable in a headless UI context. We'll start by looking at what are called phrasing elements. The emphasis you saw earlier was an example of this. Um, and we used to call them inline elements because by default they're visibly inline text. Um, but phrasing is more accurate as a description because, well, they mark up phrases, right? So we saw this example earlier. Here the word really is marked up as emphasized. Now, when spoken by a virtual assistant, Heads up, none of them quite do this yet, but I've mocked it up with the uh, speech synthesis API in JavaScript. It could sound something like this. I'm really happy to see you. Which is kind of cool. Now, sometimes emphasis is not enough. When we want to indicate that content is very important for our customers to pay attention to, the strong element is the right way to go. Because strong means that something is of strong importance. Now, visibly, M and strong are displayed as italics and bold, respectively. And in the early days of the web, when I first started out, we had the I and B element, which were rendered exactly the same. And so many of us just thought they were interchangeable. And with B and I being shorter to right, they proliferated on the web. Semantically, however, these elements are quite different from their doppelgangers. The I element is similar to the emphasis element, but it's a bit more generic. It's used to indicate an alternate voice or mood. It could be used to indicate sarcasm or idiomatic remarks or shifts in language. So it's a terrible movie and it made 200 million. Go figure, right? 
Now, in the second example here, um, you might notice that I've indicated a language being shifted to from the natural language of the document. This indicator is a simple mechanism that could inform a voice synthesizer to shift pronunciation. Here's an example of how that might work. She is admired for her energy and joie de vivre. Right? Not perfect, but we only have a couple of, of things that we can work with, a couple different voices we can work with in speech synthesis right now. Um, but it kind of points at what's possible. Um, the B element is used for content that should be set apart or in, in the parlance of the spec, stylistically offset. Um, but it's of no greater importance than the surrounding text. So I like to use it for the names of people or the names of products, things that would be like keywords within the, the content that I might want to mark up in some certain way or, or might want to visually call out in some certain way. Um, Books, films, and, and things like that have their own element, the site element, which we'll see an example of shortly. Um, and functionally, the B element is a lot like a span, which is for generic phrasing content, but with a shorter tag. Now, HTML has other specialized phrasing constructs too, such as ABBR for abbreviations and acronyms. So in this case, HTML is the standard markup language for creating web pages and web applications. And here I've given it a title um, for hypertext markup language, which is what HTML is an abbreviation for, or an acronym for, rather. Now, sadly, as with many things on the web, uh, Black Hat SEO folks uh, used the title element to, or the title attribute to put all kinds of awful stuff into pages in order to boost search engine ranking. So that basically spurned screen readers to stop reading it because this will give you a, a sense of the time. People just kept putting Pamela Anderson's name in there over and over again. Um, visual browsers still do provide tooltips, so there is some utility to the title attribute. They're not completely useless, uh, but screen readers don't pay attention to it. Um, and it's pretty unlikely that they will be surfaced by a virtual assistant. To be honest, it's probably best, unless you want that tooltip, to just avoid using title altogether. Um, for the purposes of absolute clarity in our content, you should introduce and explain important abbreviations and acronyms the first time they're used. And there isn't, there's even an element that actually signals that defining context, the DFN element. So in this case, hypertext markup language, and then in parentheses, HTML, is the standard markup language for creating web pages and web applications. Finally, there's the span element, which is used for generic phrases. It's a meaningless element, so it wouldn't be spoken in any other way uh, differently by default. There are a bunch of other ones, but I, I only have so much time that I can uh, talk to y'all. So I'm gonna try and keep it, uh, keep it brief here. Links are also phrasing elements, but I want to call them out specifically because they're a much richer interface and provide a lot more opportunity for fine tuning how our users interact with them. The primary way we use links, of course, is to link to related content, right? And it's important when we do this to actually choose meaningful words and phrases as our link text, because when assistive technologies hit click here or read more, that doesn't tell them anything about what it is that they're actually accessing. Right? Those are not useful, especially if there's several on the page. And when people skim via those links, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about shortly, um, that gets really uh, painful. So in this case, I wrote the book, Adaptive Web Design, and I've got it in a site element as well as an anchor. Um, so that's a, a pretty good example of that. Instead of saying, I wrote the book, Adaptive Web, Web Design, click here to learn more about it. Right? We can also use links, and I think that we should do this more frequently, to reference content within the current document, um, or even at specifically identified places within the document. So if you, if you are referencing a table or a figure of some sort, give that figure an ID so that it can actually be linked to from within the content of your pages. Same thing for headings. Please, God, if you're writing something on the web, put IDs on your headings so that if I want to reference something that you've written, I can actually point to at least the section that it's in. Don't make me just go to the generic page and have somebody have to hunt for where that quote is. You can even use them to inform users about uh, the language that's in use on a linked page using the hreflang attribute. So in this case, it's switching to a, a Spanish version of this page. And you can indicate the kind of content being linked to using the type attribute, you use MIME types for that. And in a relatively new addition to the HTML spec, you actually have the download keyword, which can inform the browser that the file in question should be downloaded rather than presented. Again, it's a simple attribute that makes an HTML document capable of so much more. 
It's worth noting, though, for the download attribute, that would be ignored on any cross-origin URIs. So it has to be same domain. Anchor elements also support non-web pseudo protocols. Um, two of the most common are Mail2 and um, Tell, so email and phone numbers. Um, but SMS and WebCal are also quite, uh, quite common. And some operating systems and browsers allow installed apps to also register custom protocols that serve to access in-app functionality. But I want to just throw it out there that you should be cautious about using that approach, because if the protocol is not recognized, then the operating system will often prompt the user to try and find an app that can actually use that, uh, which just adds friction to the experience. There are other ways to direct URLs into applications, uh, so I recommend looking into those. Now, all this phrasing content's great, but I've spent a little while in the weeds, the minutia, and I want to kind of pull back and look at documents themselves, because I, need to, I, I think we need to think about how we author our, our documents and our web pages on the whole. Now, as you're probably aware, headless UIs place a greater cognitive load on our users. It's hard to keep track of where you are in an interface, and it can be even more challenging to move around when you can't gather information about the interface from visual cues. Right? And the more complex an interface is, the more challenging this becomes. Now, the same is true in visual interfaces, too, which is why mobile first was such a great boon for us, because it told us we needed to focus our pages on, on single tasks and helping users to accomplish those things. It reduced the noise and raised the signal. But most web pages, I think you'd probably agree, are the antithesis of clear and straightforward. As our screen size is enlarged, we just keep shoving stuff into that space. Sharing links, related content, cross promotions, and so on. Sometimes it's easy to lose sight of what is actually the content of the page. To combat this, screen readers provide numerous mechanisms that enable users to gather information about the current interface and then move efficiently through it um, to find the bit that's most relevant to them in the current moment. So one mechanism available for skimming a document involves moving the focus caret from one interactive element to another. Now, traditionally, that movement's done via the keyboard, uh, via the tab key, but it can also be done via voice by saying next or previous, or similar commands. Now, in most documents, this means moving from link to link, which are shown here in green. And supporting skimming in this way makes the, the text that we choose for links even more critical in ensuring that our users get a good experience. Form elements and buttons are also focusable. And I'll talk a little bit more about forms towards the end of the session. Now, you can add elements that would not traditionally be focusable into the tab order by adding a tab index attribute with a value of zero. That's very important. Only do zero or negative one, never go over zero. Um, but this ensures that critical interface components are not accidentally bypassed by users who are using uh, tabbing to move through an interface. And incidentally, it also enables sighted users to interact and scroll uh, elements via the keyboard. So if you have a, a scrollable div or something like that, somebody who's using a keyboard can actually scroll that even if they're sighted. Now, another navigational mechanism is browsing by heading. The various heading levels in HTML create a natural document outline, and assistive technologies can enable users to skim content using these headings. Since only the contents of the heading elements are read out loud in this mode, I highly recommend that you avoid using cutesy marketing phrases and stick to just summarizing what the contents are of each section. And then the final way users can traverse documents is via what are called landmarks. So the concept of landmarks surfaced in the development of the ARIA spec. And the idea is that you could use the, the role attribute to define specific regions of the page based on their function. Now, in the example I have up on the screen here, the author is isolating their navigation in a div element with an ID of nav. Now, that might be meaningful to us as front-end designers and developers because we, we know that nav means navigation, but it's not exposed to assistive technology as navigation. When we explicitly add a role of navigation to that div, however, that function gets made explicit to assistive technology. And there are a ton of roles, well, not a ton, there's a, there's a handful of roles that are landmarks. And I'm gonna show you a couple of these in action. Um, if you have not checked it out, 24 ways, uh, I think it's 24ways.org, uh, 24 ways to impress your friends. It's an advent calendar for web professionals. Um, and it's a magazine, but it's highly interactive, um, and it's very accessible. And they actually use landmarks to identify all of the key areas of a page. 
such as the primary header or the banner of a site, the main content of their site, the content concerned with e easing navigation through the site, and information about the content, such as copyright designations. And here's how users uh, in a non-visual context can actually experience that. Main landmark 2015, heading level one. Navigation landmark, browse 24 ways, heading level one. Search landmark, search 24 ways. Content info landmark, copyright 2005, 2060. So landmarks also give users the opportunity to jump directly to a location with an interface, which is incredibly helpful. And in a voice context, a user might be able to ask the assistant to read me the navigation for this page, or search for baby, baby, ah, wooden baby toys. And the assistant can use these landmarks to quickly respond to those commands, all without any additional programming. Now, it's worth noting that many of these uh, roles, these landmark roles, have equivalent HTML tags, and that's because HTML5 and ARIA were being developed at the same time and sought to, to solve some of the same issues and limitations of the web at the time. Um, so banner is automatically assigned to the first header element that you use that's not contained inside of a sectioning element. Navigation is automatically assigned to nav. Main is automatically assigned to main. Complementary is assigned to aside elements. And content info is assigned to the first footer that is not inside of a sectioning element. One last bit I want to touch on before I discuss forums is the div element. We often see divs employed in web pages uh, when designers want to group related elements together, or they just don't like the native, excuse me, the native styling of a particular control, like a button. Um, now, organizing content using divs is OK, but divs are meaningless elements, and they add nothing to the interface in terms of context. By contrast, there are many organizational elements that do add a ton of context for our users. Things like paragraphs, things like lists, description lists, which are vastly underused, uh, figures, fig captions. And then in terms of grander stuff, we've got articles, sections, headers and footers, which I've, I've mentioned, nav and aside. There are a ton of meaningful elements out there that can enable our assistants to do more for our customers. And the more we use them, the more useful our assistants become and the more powerful our users feel. For instance, using article and heading elements can actually enable voice commands like read me all of the news headlines on the front page of the New York Times without involving any sort of specialized data feed. The generic div gets you none of these benefits. As you see, HTML has a lot to offer in terms of enabling our interfaces to operate effectively in the world of headless UIs. Beyond just content, though, it has the capacity to streamline interactivity, such as the kind we see in forms. Now, forms can be a bit of a necessary evil. Uh, we need them in order to gather information in the service of our users, but often they're poorly planned and even more poorly executed, which leads to poor user experience for all of our users, regardless of how they're interacting with that form. Thankfully, HTML has our backs there too, enabling us to make necessary corrections uh, or necessary connections in order to clarify uh, the purpose of a form and expedite the completion process. But let's start with something simple, field labels. So while it can be, seem perfectly reasonable to mark up form fields like this with text and then an input below it, there's no association of the question, what's your first name, with the text field that follows. To create that association, you need to use a label element. That will ensure the label can be read by assistive technology when the field is focused. And labels can be ex associated in one of two ways, either explicitly or implicitly. So explicit association relies on using the for attribute, which is an ID reference to the field that's associated with it. <clears throat> with it. So you see the for and ID there in teal, and they need to match. Implicit association relies on the label element actually containing both the label text and the field itself. You can combine these two approaches, but generally uh, explicit association is the simplest and clearest choice for most interfaces. Now, once you have a good label, it's time to turn your attention to the field itself and the type of field that we're, we're using. There are a bunch of options available in HTML now, and it's important to choose the right one for each job. So if you're just looking for a simple response from a user, the text field, or you could even leave off the type if you want to, because text is the default input type, that's going to be your go-to. But if you're asking for somebody's email address, 
there's a specific field type for that. It looks like a text field in terms of its visual display, uh, but browsers that understand type equals email can also validate that field for you automatically without involving any JavaScript. But if a browser doesn't understand the HTML field type of email, that's okay. The field will simply revert to being a text field, and you can and, and should still be validating to see if it's a valid email address either on the client side or the server side. We'll discuss that stuff in a, in a moment. But this is a perfect example of progressive enhancement, which is a topic that's quite near and dear to my heart, so much so that I've, I've written two books now on uh, progressive enhancement, both called Adaptive Web Design. Uh, the first edition is actually free to read online. Uh, it is available as a progressive web app, so you can even install it to your home screen if you want to uh, read it over time. And then the second edition just came out uh, relatively recently. But back to inputs. So we have the email, we also have the input type URL. This is another common one that we, we often have to do, especially in social contexts. Um, and as with the email field type, browsers can handle validation for you on this automatically, which is pretty cool. And in both cases, uh, in both of those instances, uh, visual browsers that have a virtual keyboard can actually provide uh, a specialized keyboard that can enable sighted users to more quickly uh, enter that information. There are a ton of other field types I could talk about, but there's, again, there's only so much time here, um, and there's a lot more I want to cover. So UX design is concerned with reducing friction of accomplishing tasks, right? So as such, we should look for every opportunity to do that in our forms. So consider this form construct, which is asking for a US phone number. This is a, a fairly common thing. Instead of a single field enabling a user to continuously type their phone number, the designers chose to break it apart into three separate fields. They probably did this to ensure consistent number formatting, right? To make sure that every number came back in the same format. But really, that's a back-end problem, right? You want to sanitize that information when you receive it from the customer. Because going down this path, the designers have placed the burden on the users rather than the developers, and the experience actually suffers for it. Sure, you can write some JavaScript that will auto-advance auto you from field to field, but without JavaScript, users have to do it manually. And even if there is JavaScript available and they get that enhancement, it can limit the, ability, the user's ability to edit one of those, these fields if they make a mistake. Furthermore, when it comes to using this interface via voice, users are required to supply three separate values. Not only that, each field then requires a label. Most developers are only gonna know how to label one of those three, the area code, and actual users would probably be baffled if you asked them for their central office code or line number. Right. For all these reasons, it just makes sense to work with what HTML gives us. There's a field for telephone numbers, input type equals tell. It doesn't validate because there are too many international uh, phone number formats, but that's okay. It's inconsequential for us to actually write the code to sanitize and homogenize structured information like phone numbers and social security numbers and the like. And honestly, we should be writing that code anyway because you can't trust the client. Even if you enforce the structure and, and consist consistency with JavaScript on the front end, we can still end up with bad data coming in to the back end. We'll come back to that idea in a moment. Now, forms can be incredibly frustrating to fill out, especially if they're particularly long. As designers, we're tasked with reducing uh, user frustration, and errors happen, right? It's a fact of life. But we can help our users avoid errors by taking a few simple steps. First of all, most browsers allow users to store information to be auto-filled into forms. Uh, some watch for common data to be filled in and then prompt the user to save it to be auto-filled later. Uh, some even go so far as to take the values you enter along with the corresponding name or ID uh, attributes that are on that field, and they'll prompt you to fill in that same information later on when they encounter that same name or ID. Uh, for this reason, it makes sense to turn autocomplete off for any fields that deal with sensitive information like passport numbers, credit cards, and the like. Um, it used to be that all we had was on and off, though. And we've actually been granted a bunch of new values that'll allow us to get very granular about the sort of information we're expecting to be auto-completed into these fields. Um, and there are a ton of uh, tokens for doing this. I'm not gonna get into all of these, but I will walk you through an example. Here, I've got a question. Is there a mobile number we can reach you on regarding delivery? So in this case, we're doing an autocomplete of shipping, mobile, tell. So we've got three modifiers there. We're asking for a telephone number that's associated with shipping, right? A mobile telephone number that's associated with shipping. Uh, 
So we've actually got some direct uh, connections between the label and the, uh, the autocomplete tokens we're using. Um, as, I, as I'm sure you can imagine, the sort of affordance can do a ton to reduce the friction of filling in forms. And if you're keen to learn more about these autofill tokens, Jason Grigsby, uh, who works at Cloud4 uh, down in Portland, he wrote a very lengthy piece uh, about these on the Cloud4 blog. So I highly recommend checking that out. So we can help users fill out form fields more quickly, but what about everything else? Well, first of all, we should always let users know when a field is required. A common approach is to provide a visual indicator if not all of the fields on the form are required. Um, and obviously, it would be best to avoid the situation altogether and only have required fields in the form. Then you could simply introduce it saying all fields are required. Regardless of the way you go, however, the required attribute should be used in order to ensure modern browsers can't allow a user to submit a form when the field is empty. And then you use the ARIA required attribute to actually inform assistive technology that the field is required. Unfortunately, browsers don't map them automatically. You should also provide helpful hints to users in order to help them avoid issues before they encounter them. So here we're asking for a complex pattern for a delta flight number with DL followed by two or more numbers. And so I am giving a placeholder to indicate the sort of content that I want. And then I have the pattern attribute, which is actually creating the regular expression uh, to validate against for the browser. Round trips to the server are expensive, so especially on flaky networks. So we want to help our users avoid these things by doing validation in the browser as much as we can. And we can rely on these tools in order to do that. Um, so it starts with the required attribute so that we don't have empty fields being submitted if we need them. Um, and then it comes to choosing the right field type, as I mentioned, so that we get native validation if we can. And then we can fall back to the pattern attribute if there's not a na native validation scheme. Um, and then browsers that actually implement the HTML5 validation algorithm will notify users in line of fields that have errors. And so often they will highlight the first error and then uh, have the user work on fixing that before it can be submitted. There is also the HTML5 validation algorithm on the JavaScript end, and you can take this stuff over on your own and, and manage that experience for your users, all by paying attention to those attributes that, that have been assigned. Even if the browser doesn't understand HTML5 validation, you can roll your own JavaScript library to do it in, I don't know, I, I did it in like 100 lines of code, very, very spaced out and commented. It's really simple. Um, and then once you've got inline errors, when you're wanting to highlight those yourself, you want to mark them invalid using the aria invalid attribute, so assistive technology knows there's an issue here. And then the error message can be associated using aria described by, uh, which is an ID reference, much like the for attribute. Um, and so you can see that here in orange. Your email star edit required invalid entry. Your email address is required blank. So that's pretty helpful, All right? Eventually, ARIA described by will be replaced by ARIA error message uh, in this context, but the support's not there yet. So that's something down the road. Now, client-side validation is great, but there's no substitute for doing some form of server-side validation. And there's a good reason. I'm going to tell you a quick story because I know we're, we're at time here. Uh, but back in 2001, when the original Xbox was the game system to drool over, we as an industry put a lot of faith in the browser and didn't realize how our sites could be manipulated or hacked. And I remember an instance where a major vulnerability was discovered in an e-commerce site and involved this gaming system. In their infinite wisdom, the developer had actually put the price of the Xbox in a hidden input. And since it was hidden, no one could see it. An enterprising web designer could view source and see it, but these were the days before browsers actually had tools for web developers to manipulate documents in, in real time. But they did have this thing called save. <laughs> So you could save a web page for offline viewing. So one enterprising person did that very thing, edited the file, and uh, changed that value to a dollar. And then they loaded the HTML document in their browser, submitted the form, and they got their uh, Xbox about two weeks later for a buck. Um, the developer didn't have any checks in place to make sure that products couldn't be sold for less than the value uh, that, that they listed as the price. They didn't realize you can't trust the client. You should always validate on the server side because 
even if a user has JavaScript turned on, has a browser capable of doing HTML5 validation, you can't assume that the validation criteria was actually met. It's totally inconsequential to change a web page's markup, to adjust scripts, to adjust forms, or otherwise compromise a web page using only, only the tools that are built into virtually every browser out there. How many of you have changed a form in order to actually be able to submit it? Yeah. <laughs> this happens all the time, right? We need to, to actually never trust the client. We need to always make sure we're getting what we're expecting. And since the server side is your last line of defense, we need to be ready to, to go back to that form again and provide information about what the errors are that we encountered. So we want to sum summarize those server side errors in some sort of message at the top. Um, put it at the top of the form. Start with a helpful introduction. There were some errors with your form submission. List the errors and the orders that they're, that they're presented in the form. and link to each of those uh, fields that have an error. The nice thing is we've got anchor references directly to those uh, fields because they all have IDs on them, right? So that makes it really simple to do so. And if you add a role of alert in some browsers, although the, the, this has kind of ebbed and flowed and changed over the time, but some of them do something cool like this when the page loads. Contact retreats for weeks. There were errors with your form submission. One, message is a required field. Two, name is a required field. Three, email is a required field. How friggin' awesome is that? That's so helpful when you can't visually see the form, right? Then use the pattern I showed earlier to make sure that you indicate in line what the actual problem was, is and help people to, to solve that. And of course, make sure that you bring back the value that they entered in case they just have to make a slight change to it. Um, so HTML is a truly robust and expressive language, but it's often overlooked and undervalued. But it has the incredible potential to nurture conversations with our users without requiring a whole lot of effort on our part. Simply taking the time to code web pages well will enable our sites to do more, thereby enabling our users to do more. Hopefully, this rather brief overview has opened up your eyes to the wonderful world of HTML and how semantic markup can make our content structured, sensible, and most importantly, meaningful. And if you are already a true believer, I hope you walk away from this session with a few new techniques that you can put to use in your own work. Thank you all very much.